So this session is called HTML5 Web Component State of the Union. I, I thought about dropping HTML5 from the name because it's kind of not a big deal. But uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, web components, um, what they are, um, how they're being used, and how you can use them, um, and how important they are, at least how I feel uh, they're important uh, for uh, building web applications moving forward. Uh, so just before I get started, uh, how many people here uh, currently uh, write front-end web applications? Okay. How many, how many people use Angular? How many people use React? How many people have used web components? All right, so a few of you. How many of you have used like Backbone or Marionette or Ember or some other web framework? Okay. How many of you have just written jQuery? All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so uh, my name is Kido. Uh, I've been working with uh, Java um, and Java EE for quite a while. And the last several years, I've also been working with Polymer and Web Components uh, and also Angular as well. Uh, my company, I run a little uh, consulting company. Uh, we're also a partner with a company called Prime Tech that uh, has some open source components for uh, Java server faces, but also Angular and uh, React as well. Uh, I wrote a book a long time ago. Um, I, uh, I'm the co-host of a newscast, uh, which we haven't done in a few months. Hopefully we'll get back to it soon. But it's just me and a couple other guys talk about different development topics, some of which are Java, some of which are front end, etc. I'm a Java champion and also a uh, Google developer expert in web technologies. Uh, so I'm focused more on the core platform technologies as opposed to a particular framework like Angular. Uh, and I've spoken to lots of conferences. Uh, so that's my story. I'm going to have a handle on you guys, which is good. So let me get started. Um, I just want to take a step back and talk about UI components in general, because um, this is an area that I've been very passionate about. Um, over the years, even before I got into more front-end technologies, working with Java server faces uh, as a Java server-side technology, that was a main selling point, was the idea of having UI reusable components. Um, and uh, if you take a look at like any application out there, you know, let's say this is, this is an older uh, 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 screenshot of Dropbox, you can break it down into individual UI components, right? Like you could look at this and say, okay, well, there's a data grid, um, there's some buttons on the left, there's like a breadcrumb component at the top, there's a toolbar, there's a search box, um, there's some sort of drop down at the top, okay? So you can decompose any UI basically into a set of U actual, actual functional components, okay? And it turns out, you know, the components are pretty much everywhere. They've been around for a long time, even before all this web stuff, right? So how many people uh, ever wrote an application with Visual Basic, Delphi, or Power Builder? Anybody? All right, there's some old people here. Good. All right, so uh, I started with Delphi, um, and that's sort of what got me into components, because they had all these great UI widgets for building your application, and there were also other third-party libraries you could get. Now, it was all proprietary, because it was based on the Delphi development tool, but it was pretty cool. Um, so uh, also, you get the same thing with uh, window, WinForms uh, with the .NET world. Um, ASP.NET had uh, components as well, still does. Um, then also Swing, Swing has components, right? Um, JavaFX has some components. Um, and Java server faces on the server side. And in the browser, um, component suites and frameworks over the years have had to sort of invent their component models, right? So if you looked at, how many people remember YUI? Anybody? Yeah, so that was hip for a while, right? Um, but then also ones that are still around, like Kindle UI, um, Bootstrap, um, third party or, or commercial suites, uh, like Improgistics, et cetera, they all have built their own component models over the years, okay? And even if you look at Angular and React, they've done the same thing. There's an, an, a way to, way, to react, way to write an Angular component, a way to write a React component. But each sort of framework or, set, or library has come up with its own way to build components. Okay? So what that means is that the consensus now is, is pretty clear that it's kind of a good idea to build your UIs out of components. Right? That building up a UI from small reusable blocks is a pretty logical way to do things. It's just that the way to do it differs depending on which, which platform, which uh, library you're using. 
So we build components, number one, to have some sort of reusable UI functionality, right? So if you have a breadcrumb, you want to be able to use it on, on all the pages that need breadcrumbs or a button, you want it to look the same on all the different pages. Um, and that's also helpful across different applications, right? So, you know, you build one application and, well, your guidelines say that all the buttons need to behave the same in other applications as well. Well, then it makes sense to have that same button uh, be something that you can reuse across applications, not just within the same application. And like most things in the world of uh, software development, the idea is to let you focus on your core application functionality, right? Whatever actually you're trying to do, as opposed to how do I write a cool drop-down component or how do I write a data table? That's not really an essential problem that you need to solve. So by having a component to do that work for you, you can focus on the actual business logic um, that you need to work with or what your actual uh, goals are to, on, uh, in terms of building the application. So for the most part over the years, uh, even though we may have had uh, a component model in terms of how we built the application, the browser didn't support it, right? So even though we may be using some cool widget framework to do stuff, the browser said, okay, well, I understand divs and spans and you know, input elements and buttons and you know, a few primitives, but I don't understand all this higher level stuff, okay? So at the end of the day, what got sent to the browser was really a whole bunch of divs and spans and other sort of primitives, but nothing that really told the browser or explained what the application was doing or where those widgets were. That was all an abstraction built using whatever framework or libraries you were using, right? And we like abstractions, right? Um, so even though uh, the actual browser doesn't support these, you know, these primitives, this, this, this way of building components, we wanted to be able to do it in some way, right? So this is an example of a Java server faces uh, data table, um, which actually looks very similar to the data table in many front end frameworks these days. So you, you build it this way, you don't have to worry about the markup or the nuances of how a data table works. <clears throat> um, this is an example of uh, bootstrap dropdowns. So here you actually do use some of the primitives, but you sprinkle some special stuff in there uh, that tells bootstrap to turn it into a cool component. Okay. And um, if you work with any other uh, modern framework like React or Angular or Vue or et cetera, they're going to do the same thing. They'll give you a cool component model to work with, and then they'll turn it into something the browser can understand, right? So I said until recently, browser, the browser didn't really understand this higher level concept of a, of a component, but it actually does now, and that's what we call a web component. So web components bring a native component model to uh, HTML, all right? and to modern browsers. So we're actually at a point now where the browser actually has a way to understand components, um, regardless of which framework you're using, okay? So let's say you want to, uh, you know, display a modal dialog, pretty straightforward thing, right? Pop up a div, user can't do anything until they click on the button, right? This is an example of a web component to do that, okay? this is a paper action dialog, and uh, you see it has some properties that you can set, and uh, when someone clicks on it, it'll, or when, when it's open, it'll pop up that window, okay? But what's nice about this, this is not some framework. This isn't an Angular component. This is not a React component. This is not anything like that. This is actually a web component. So this is actually being understood natively by the browser without a specific big framework to go behind it, okay? So web components, just like any, any other sort of component that you may think of, um, they don't have to be visual. So the, the previous example was a dialogue popping up, right? Um, this example is actually a, a wrapper for Firebase. Um, so uh, Firebase is a Google product for, um, it's sort of a, a real-time uh, interactive database, right? So uh, you can have a web component that does that as well. 
okay? It just doesn't have a visual representation, but it's actually in the DOM, it's understood by the browser, and you can interact with it programmatically, okay? So I'm just gonna do a quick demo here, and uh, this is a good demo because it's actually YouTube. So one of the biggest proponents of web components is actually Google. Um, so this is the YouTube front page. This is the desktop YouTube. Uh, the mobile one is a little bit different. But if you just take a look at um, what's inside YouTube, okay. And let me get rid of this. And we'll shrink YouTube over here. Okay. So if you look at it, you notice everything inside of YouTube here is in this YTD app, okay? And then there's YTD Activity Manager, YTD, et cetera, okay? So these are actually all web components. Uh, YouTube is actually built, the recent version of it is built using web components and using a framework called Polymer from Google, okay? Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of nice to see because it's an example of a very large scale site, right, that we're all very familiar with. Um, that actually uses web components. So I'll show some more demos, but uh, this is always a good, good, uh, good way to sort of give an intro. And you see it's sort of, it's pretty logical. You know, there's a navigation manager, there's a playlist manager, okay? And there's also some divs as well, but there's a lot of actual web components in there, okay? Of course, I seem to have lost my tabs here. All right. So the web, web components are basically a collection of a few different HTML5 standards. And you know, HTML5 these days pretty much means anything that came out in the last few few years and will come out in the next several years, so it pretty much means current HTML specs, essentially. So there's a few different ones. There is custom elements, HTML templates, HTML imports, and Shadow DOM. And uh, of course, Shadow DOM has the coolest name, if you ask me. Uh, so let, let's take a look at some of these. So the first one, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Uh, sorry, it's not gonna be much bigger, I apologize. Um, is custom elements. And these are sort of the linchpin of the whole thing. So custom elements basically allow you to write some JavaScript which essentially tells the browser um, to register a particular tag name and then associates that tag name with your JavaScript, okay? So that's like the number one thing. You, you really can't have web components without custom elements, okay? So this is an example of a very simple component that just outputs, um, that says, hello, component world, okay? And this is the code, okay? So the first thing you'll notice is that this extends uh, HTML element, okay? So you can actually now extend the base HTML element. Um, now, the next question might be, well, can I extend like the input tag? Um, technically, in terms of the specification, you can, but most browsers don't support that. Um, Apple is very much against it, uh, so it's sort of like murky as to whether or not you can count on that being uh, something you can use. But at the very least, you can subclass the uh, base HTML element, okay? And basically, the first thing here is I'm saying, anytime someone changes this attribute, um, I wanna be notified, this message attribute. Because, you know, HTML elements have lots of different attributes and people can set arbitrary attributes on them, so you may not wanna be notified of all of them, okay? Uh, and then what I'm doing is I have a getter and setter for message property, and you can see it just gets and sets the attribute, so this gives me sort of a programmatic API. Um, I've got a constructor, uh, and there are some callbacks, so I can get a callback when the element is connected to the DOM. Remember, by DOM, I'm just talking about the document object model in the browser, okay? Um, I can also get notified when my component is disconnected, um, and when that attribute changes, or any attributes that I care about. And then, um, if my element gets moved from one uh, page to another, um, I can get notified of that, of that as well. 
And then there's this last part, which is very important. Uh, custom elements dot define VT echo, right? So I'm defining my uh, element name and then giving it the class name that goes with it. And uh, there's a rule, which is if you write a custom element, it has to start with, uh, has to have a dash and then the name. So, and that's basically to differentiate, differentiate it from the standard elements, okay? So obviously you don't have to listen to all the callbacks, but this is an example. All right, so let's take a look at an example here. All right, so let's say I've got a counter component, right? All right, and there it goes, it counts. Exciting, right? Um, now, if I look at this in the browser, okay, you'll see I've got this, uh, uh, yeah, this is just, that's not the important part. The important part is right here, all right. So this is my component, right? This is the VT counter, and you can see that it's increasing the value, right? Um, and uh, the code will be pretty much what I just showed you. Okay. Um, but what's nice is that this is actually running natively in the browser. This is not, I don't have to run some framework to compile it into something, to do something special. This is just natively in the browser. Okay. And I can also do interesting things like this. So um, this component is called uh, VT counter, right? If I go back here. All right. So I can do this like a... Um, So now I've got a counter, right? Okay, and I can actually manipulate it in real time, right? So this is something I can't do with like Angular, right? Whenever Angular creates, I don't know how to get to it. <laughs> it's, it's magical Angular stuff that lives in the Angular land, right? But here I can just in the browser. So I do a lot of Angular development and I wish sometimes I could just inspect the application easily. Um, like this. So, uh, so whatever components are on the page, I can manipulate them using whatever properties are available on that component. And then the wizard message, so there's no message property. Okay. Um, but um, basically, the component has an API and it can actually be manipulated at runtime as well. Okay. So um, when it comes to any new browser technology, the question is, well, does it work in IE 11? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> but it does work in lots of other browsers. So uh, custom elements enjoy support pretty much everywhere, um, except for um, Edge, which is currently working on it. And of course, IE 11. And the main reason nothing works in IE 11 is because they don't really work on it anymore. All right, so another one is HTML templates. And HTML templates basically allow you to take a chunk of HTML and then sort of hold on to it for later, okay? So basically, if something is defined as a template, like we have here, um, the browser is gonna say, all right, this is a template, but it's not gonna render it and parse it or do anything with it. It's gonna hold on to it for you. And then you can actually do stuff. So here, um, I am importing a template element, okay? and then uh, adding it to the body, okay? And then adding it to the body again. And then you can add it to the body again. You can do whatever you want with it. You can even inspect it and mess with it, okay? So uh, this gives you a sort of a basic building block for creating templating uh, libraries, okay? It doesn't do cool things like, it, you know, it doesn't have any magical way to um, uh, uh, bind variables and stuff in there that's not built into it. Um, but it does give you a basic construct that you can use, okay? All right, so this particular example would just display that twice because that template had that, that uh, text and then it was appended to the body twice, okay? So HTML template has actually been around for a long time. It's, it's been around longer than any of the other specs. Um, so that's fully supported by everything except for IE, of course. 
and I did actually update these. The, all these, these uh, charts are from caniuse.com. If you have not been there, you should check it out. It's a great place to go to if you want to check browser compatibility for any feature um, at all, whether it's a JavaScript feature or just an HTML feature. Um, so, and I actually updated these today. So these are up today. Okay, so um, there's also uh, HTML imports. And um, HTML imports basically allow you to uh, have JavaScript or script files and other resources um, inside of an HTML file, but then actually import that whole HTML file as a set of dependencies, okay? So this is just an simple example. Let's say you wanted to use Bootstrap in your application, um, and there's all this stuff you need to do in order to, to include Bootstrap. Okay, you need to include some JavaScript files, um, add some special stuff for, for IE, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Um, well, let's say you wanted to be able to do that in different pages. Um, you could actually take this whole thing and put it in a file called bootstrap.html and then um, just import that file by itself. Um, so this would be the bootstrap.html file, right? And then you could import it like this and then you'd, and you'd just have that particular dependency, okay? And this becomes pretty cool if you have lots of different uh, dependencies, lots of different uh, components and things you want to import. You can just import them in your page this way, um, which is kind of nice. So, so that's HTML imports. Um, HTML imports does not have the same level of support as the other specifications. This is largely because although um, the standard was in written and everything, it was implemented in Chrome, um, none of the other browser vendors really liked it. Um, and actually it was mainly uh, Mozilla and Firefox that said, this is cool, but this is a completely uh, another way to handle dependencies. I mean, all, we already have JavaScript modules for handling dependencies, okay? So JavaScript modules uh, basically also create a dependency graph and things like that. Um, so they didn't want to have two ways to do it. So HTML imports you may see mentioned occasionally with web components, but it's not really taking off. So I just mentioned it here just as a footnote. All right, so then the other thing is Shadow DOM. And Shadow DOM is best shown with an example, okay? So this is another counter, right? All right, so uh, let's see, what is this counter called? This is called VT counter Shadow DOM, all right. Actually, well, we'll do this first and then I'll show you something else. Okay, so there's my counter element. And you may have noticed um, when I was looking at the previous counter, right, I could see the inside, right, which is a very simple span, right? And if I had said, um, let's say, uh, I wanted to, let's say, change all the spans to be a certain color. Okay, so that works fine, right? So I could change all the spans on the page and then change the span inside of my, my counter, right? Now, Let's say I wanted to do the same thing here, okay? So inside here, you know, this is a little bit different though. I've got this thing called a shadow root, okay? And then I have a div, okay? So let's, let's say I wanted to do the same thing. Let's say I wanted to um, do the same thing for divs. Whoops. Now, has anyone noticed anything different? The CSS that I created is not affecting the, what's inside my component, right? So the DOM within my component is actually encapsulated, okay? And if I did something like this, let's say I did a counter.query selector div.
There's my div, and that's there because I'm getting this shutter root is open, okay? But I could even make it so that you couldn't even query the shadow root if you wanted to, okay? So shadow root basically gives you a way to encapsulate the internals of your component so that styling doesn't mess up your component. Um, and uh, it also sort of gives you some privacy in terms of how your component is implemented, right? And the way it works is like this, okay? Uh, actually, that's not the right one. Let's find this one, okay? So, first of all, you see up here, um, I have some inner HTML I'm creating, okay? So, basically, um, I'm creating a template, okay? And I'm actually applying some styles. Host means apply to the host element to this current component, okay? Um, and I'm also applying some other styles as well, okay? And then slot allows me to insert content inside of my component, okay? So, Whoever uses my component can insert content that they want to be displayed inside my component. And this is something you find in Angular and other libraries as well. Excuse me? He's saying, is it like translocation? And yeah, it's pretty much saying, okay, I want to, um, I'm creating my component, I'm using your component, I'm putting stuff inside of it, and then it sort of gets moved sort of magically inside of the component, okay? Even though it's not really inside there, but, but, but it, it seems like it is. Okay. And this is my component, and really the only difference here is I'm taking the template content here, and, and this could be a string or something if I wanted to, but um, basically attaching a shadow root, okay, and then appending the child to the shadow root, okay. So, and this one actually subclasses the previous flow, which is why there's less code in here, okay. So, as an example, um, Actually, that's not gonna be an example. Let's see. Yeah, so, and actually, th this is a good point. So, so the shadow root actually is inside here. So this is the internal co content, okay? This div is basically just a child that I put in there. So this is the slot that's being put in, okay? Um, and then, See, this is, this is a good example when you said translocation, right? So here it's saying reveal, right? And saying, show me where the slot is from, right? And it's right here, okay? So it's being, even though I'm putting it inside of the element in my actual HTML, the browser is sort of slotting it in here, okay? You could have multiple slots and things like that with different names as well, okay? So let's try our DOM. And to me, that and custom elements are really sort of the key things. The, the template, HTML template is a nice plus, okay? Um, but custom elements is very key, and then Shadow DOM gives you really the level of encapsulation that you need to build more complicated components, okay? All right, so Shadow DOM, um, is, is getting, it's taken a while because it's actually the most difficult one for the browser or vendors to implement. Um, but uh, as of now, everyone supports it uh, except for Edge, and Edge is actually working on it. Okay, so, so Shadow DOM is doing pretty well. So in terms of browser support, I'll just summarize this. Chrome, Android, uh, and Opera support everything. So you don't actually use Opera recently. I keep on asking, but I haven't found anyone. But apparently, someone, okay. Apparently, someone out there uses it because they keep on developing it. So, so all right. Um, IE doesn't support anything, um, basically because they don't develop it anymore. Safari supports uh, pretty much everything except for HTML uh, imports. Firefox supports everything except for HTML imports. And Edge supports HTML templates, and they're working on custom elements and Shadow DOM, okay? So uh, we're actually at a pretty good spot uh, where all the major browser vendors are supporting these three specifications. Edge is a little slower, um, but they are going to support it um, when they're finished developing it, so. Uh, so, uh, however, in, you know, those of you who do front-end development in general probably know that there are these things called polyfills, right? Uh, how many people have heard of polyfills? 
All right. So a polyfill is just uh, basically a way to add existing functionality to a browser um, that isn't already there. Okay. So in the case of IE um, or uh, any older versions of, of the other browsers um, that don't get have these features, there's a polyfill which will add that support. And um, I'd say pretty much um, all of it can be supported by webcomponents.js. The only one that's not really big um, for use is the, uh, is the Shadow DOM polyfill. It's kind of clunky and slow. So the general rule is that if, if you're going to use um, the polyfills, then turn off Shadow DOM uh, for, for browsers that don't support uh, Shadow DOM natively. Okay. Um, but webcomponents.js is, is sort of the standard polyfill, and it's very, um, it's very performant. And it also works with all of the, ma all of the uh, major browsers, and it, it'll only load parts that it needs to. All right, so in the wild, there are different uh, sets of components you can use. Um, so uh, Polymer Elements would be one. Um, Google Web Components is another one, and, and uh, Polymer Elements are, have a lot of visual components, sort of components for building applications, sort of application building block components. Um, Google Web Components is more about wrapping Google Web Services like Firebase or YouTube or whatever, um, a lot of their cloud services in Web Components. Um, there's some CMS components called Simpla. The, there's Strand Web Components. There's Vaden, Vaden Elements. They're actually here because um, they also have a very you know, mature Java offering. So they're here if you want to talk to them about their web components. They actually have a lot of web components. Um, Expand.js is another one. So these are just different libraries of web components that you can use off the shelf. How many people have heard of Ionic before? So a few of you. So Ionic has uh, been, around, been around for a while and they're actually building all of their current, the newest versions of their components off of web components as sort of the standard base. So it's another one out there. Um, there's also a site called webcomponents.org you can take a look at. And webcomponents.org um, basically uh, is, a, is, is sort of a directory of web components that are free and open source for the most part. Um, so if you want to, want to sort of see what components are available, you can go there and take a look. And in terms of who actually uses it, um, Google is, is the best example because they're a big company um, and they use it on sites like YouTube, but they also use it for other ones like um, I think the Play Store and Google Fi and Google Patents and a few other sites like that. Um, but YouTube's obviously the biggest one. Um, GE uses it for their Predix um, uh, industrial IoT components. Um, McDonald's uses it for their menus. Um, so if you go to McDonald's and you see the menu, it's actually web components, which is kind of interesting. Um, ING, Comcast, Comcast is a big user. Um, I think they use it for, I think their Xfinity Home stuff and, and also internally as well. Um, Netflix, uh, Gunnet, USA Today, Coca-Cola, Electronic Arts, and also the Salvation Army. I've actually worked on, with a company that did Salvation Army stuff, so, uh, so we used it for that as well. All right, so Google spearheaded a lot of the web component specs. Um, they basically spent a lot of time sort of decomposing all the different frameworks and figuring out what was it about the web platform that needed to be enhanced to really provide um, what developers needed. Um, so a lot of it, a lot of the initial specs came from that work. Um, and uh, Google also has the Polymer project, which is sort of their breeding ground for web component uh, products or projects. Um, and they use web components in over 700 projects, um, have over a billion users. And this is actually older stats. I'm not sure what the current stats are. Um, over 4,000 custom web components. And um, they also use it in Chrome, too. If you look at the Chrome uh, UI, the settings and everything, that's all web components, too. Uh, so, so Google is a big user. And it's funny because Google is also, of course, a big user of Angular. So they sort of use both. Um, and I think they have different use cases for them. Okay. I think they use web components for more public facing, higher volume things and more complicated, uh, really complicated applications they probably use Angular for. So, 
All right, so there's lots of different ways you can write web components. You can write them using uh, vanilla JavaScript, right, like I just uh, showed you. You can also use the Polymer project, Skate.js uh, Stencil, which is from Ionic, Glimmer, which is from the Ember folks, Xtag, which is from Microsoft. And these are ones I haven't looked at yet. Um, I just, I found these today, hybrids, um, I think it's an MBA. P and Slim, so these are another ones. And what's interesting is they all basically just provide a little bit of syntactic sugar or some extra features on top of web components. Um, and you can actually now even write web components with Angular as well, using Angular elements. So uh, there's lots of different ways. And the reason you'd wanna do this is number one, if you're building web, your application using web components, obviously, but also number two, if you need to reuse functionality across different web frameworks, right? Um, so you have some widget which your company needs to use, but this, comp this, this uh, group is using React, this one is using um, Angular, or maybe you have a content management system and you just need to throw in a little bit of functionality. You don't need a whole web framework just to add in like one little widget that does one thing, okay? All right, so I've mentioned Polymer. Um, Polymer is a good place to look if you wanna look at ways to write web components, okay? Um, again, it's from Google. And it adds some additional features uh, for writing web components. You can have uh, data binding and uh, observers and things like that. Although um, they have a newer project called Lit Element, which is more lightweight. So that's another thing to look at if you just want a, a very simple way to do it without a lot of extra features. Lit Element is sort of the way to go. Uh, so this is an example. This is actually an example using Polymer uh, 2. Polymer 3 is a little bit different. Um, but essentially, uh, this is an example of using uh, a Polymer element, okay? So this is the element, and then uh, this is using an HTML import, which in Polymer 3, it wouldn't use an HTML import. Um, and uh, you have to use this Web Components Loader if you wanna have the polyfill, okay? Um, the way this looks, though, is a little bit different than what we saw earlier, right? So um, this, Polymer 2 lets you include templates in templates and JavaScript in the same file, okay? Polymer 3 kind of goes the whole JavaScript route where everything is JavaScript. Um, so they have, they have two different ways to do it. Um, but here we've got a template. Um, I have some styling and then I'm just, have, I'm just displaying a message, okay? Um, and then I've got properties that I'm returning. I'm extending polymer.element instead of HTML element, okay? Um, and basically this uh, returns uh, all the different properties that I want to support and some additional features uh, for Polymer to sort of tell it what to do, okay? Um, and then the callbacks it has are a little bit different. It has a ready callback, um, but also it has the standard web component callbacks as well, okay? Um, and again, you still have to define the component and tell the browser to actually use it, okay? So it's a little bit different, gives you a little bit, a little bit of syntactic sugar, um, but at the end of the day, it's pretty much the same thing, okay? So uh, this is what it looks like. It just made this one look nicer, but it's pretty much the same thing, okay? So Skate is another library um, that just basically gives you uh, custom elements in Shadow DOM, and then also lets you pick your own renderer so you can just render output directly to the DOM, um, or you can pick uh, something like Preact or something else to do your rendering. So, um, and it's very, they're very in a sort of a functional way of doing things. So they also have a renderer for uh, React and lit HTML as well. So this is an example of using a skate component. This is an example of writing one. Um, so you can send a component and there are just different callbacks you can use, but you see there's this renderer callback, okay? Um, and there's also uh, methods that get called for changing properties, setting properties, et cetera, okay? So obviously you don't have to implement all the callbacks, but this is just an example. So basically it gives you just additional features um, on top of the standard web component spec. Another one is Skate. Um, I'm sorry, that was Skate, sorry. <laughs> Another one is Stencil. And uh, Stencil, I think, is, is to me one of, the, one of the ones I'm watching. So 
I've been I've done projects on, with Polymer um, and uh, Stencil is intriguing because it's while Polymer is really more about runtime features, um, Stencil is a compiler, um, which is similar to uh, Angular at this point, big end compiler. Um, so Stencil will give you a way to write web components and then it generates the output um, in standard standard web components uh, format. Okay. Um, and it has a TypeScript, uses TypeScript and uses a JSX style language um, like, like React, okay? Um, and it gives you uh, data binding, a virtual DOM, async rendering, um, and it also does server-side rendering. And the, not only does it have lots of features, but also um, since it's used by Ionic, whose business is about selling components, you know that they've done a lot of work testing it and making sure it fulfills their requirements, okay? Uh, so uh, this is using a component. As you can see, the usage of these components is all pretty much the same, right? Um, this is a stencil component. This is using TypeScript. Um, TypeScript has decorators, uh, which look like at, um, annotations in Java. So uh, we say this is a, a component, um, and uh, we say this is a property. Um, we can render it um, different ways. This is kind of using... Um, uh, the JSX style, so you can just put HTML in here, okay? And then, of course, it has its own callbacks, which are a little bit different than the standard callbacks, okay? So when things are updated, when it did update, when it unloaded, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But uh, you know, so this is just a very simple example, but Stencil's a good one to watch in terms of ways to write web components. That's just the, uh... all right, so what about playing with others, all right? So this is all nice, but you know, what about, oh, these are my kids, by the way. Um, so what about uh, actually using it with other frameworks and technologies, right? So if you want to use web components with Angular, um, the good news is that Angular has built-in support for web components. Anyone ever used Angular and gotten that, that error saying, if this is a custom element, use the custom element schema. Anyone seen that before? All right, so that's basically saying if you, if you know you're using a web component, you can just tell Angular and it'll, it'll won't complain about it, basically. Um, so you can already use web components with Angular um, as it is. And if you have an Angular application and you want to expose um, the functionality as a web component, you can do that using Angular elements, okay? And that allows you to take basically whatever Angular functionality you've created, wrap it as a web component, which you can then use in other frameworks or on standalone on a page that has other stuff on it, okay? Um, so uh, I'm gonna put these slides, I'm gonna upload them to the conference uh, site so when they're available, you can click on these links. <laughs> There's presentations there. Uh, React um, allows you to use web components. Usually you want to use them as a leaf component, which means sort of at the bottom of your component tree. Um, so like, you know, a simple thing like an input controller or a widget or something, you know, an, a button or something like that without a lot of functionality. Um, there may be some additional work required. Um, you can also use a React inside of a web component if you want to, um, sort of like Angular Elements. There's nothing to keep you from doing that. Um, there's also a session on that as well. Actually, I think this is a link to an article. So, um, Vue has built-in support for web components. Um, it's very easy to expose a Vue component as a web component. How many people here use Vue? Anybody? All right, so a few of you. Um, and uh, yeah, so Vue has very good support for web components. You can use Vue to create your own components or consume existing components. So if you want to ensure, excuse me, if you want to ensure in interop, um, the smaller amount of library use, features you use, the better. Um, so if you, what you're aiming is to interrupt, is to use your web component in different frameworks, then pick either write vanilla JavaScript or pick a lighter weight way to write, write web components. Don't pick like, like a heavy, like a, Polymer is cool, but I probably wouldn't use the entire Polymer library if I was going to, have my component consumed by other uh, frameworks, but I might use lit element, which is a very lightweight component. So that's an example. Uh, another thing is that if you want to send your data down through properties and send your data up through events, so in other words, avoid two-way data binding and just someone sets a property, you take it. If you want to tell them that it changed, just send the, an event back. Okay. And there's also a great site called Custom Elements Everywhere. Okay, 
So if you want to see if your framework supports it, you can go here and you can actually see a score that tells you how well your framework supports web components. Okay. So, and you see Preact is sort of in the middle there. React, eh, not the best. You can still do it, but it's not the easiest. Um, so this is a good way, good way to, good place to look if you're trying to figure out if you can use web components with your framework. Okay. All right, and when you're done, you can actually have your, your apps uh, playing with web components, right? All right, so features now, um, web components are baked into the web platform, which is very exciting. So just you know, going forward, remember that it doesn't always have to be the uh, framework's component model. It can actually be the platform's component model, okay? And um, there are some examples um, on GitHub. Uh, they need to be updated a little bit, but there are some of the examples that are used uh, in this session. Um, take a look at webcomponents.org, uh, and also you can check out my, my site uh, as well, virtual.tech. All right, I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much.